variety of publications, including Tablet, The Washington Post, Commentary, Times Higher Education, The Audit, The Forward, and other very et cetera, prominent et cetera. Uh, periodicals, uh, outlets for publication. So please uh, join me to welcome Thank you. Professor William Cole. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning. It's still considered morning, right? I was, I was planning on giving a, a, a very conventional lecture on, on anti-Semitism. Um, I met Charles in Tel Aviv, and he invited me to come here. In the interim, I went to Strasbourg. Has, has anybody been here? Any here? Anyone here been to Strasbourg? Yeah? It's an incredible city, right? I, I, you can see already that even though there are a lot of us, I'd like to kind of open it up from the very beginning and have a kind of seminar, right? So I'm, I'm not just asking rhetorical questions. Um, so Strasbourg is an incredible city. Um, in 1349, all of the Jews were rounded up in the public square and burnt. But apparently that was not only happening in Strasbourg, that was happening all over Europe because of fear of the Black Plague. However, in the history of anti-Semitism, Strasbourg does have its own distinction because in 1390, they were the first European city to throw all the Jews out of their city. Uh, of course, somebody could say, of course, the, the Jews were thrown out of England in 1240, but this was a European city that decided on its own to throw people out. One of the extraordinary things about Strasbourg, uh, aside from it being an incredible cosmopolitan city, is that it has what was the highest structure in Europe until the 19th century, the Strasbourg Cathedral. Um, it, it towers over the, the modern city. One can only imagine the way it towered over a medieval city. Um, it took about 40 years for it to be put up, and it was put up really at about the same time that these anti-Semitic incidents were happening. It's, it's incredible because on the one, you, you see the kind of contradiction of Europe. On the one hand, this is extraordinary beauty. It's one of the most beautiful cathedrals in the world. And on the other hand, the kind of subtext is the always present text of the destruction of, of if not the destruction of J the Jews, um, violence against the Jews, murder of the Jews. And in Strasbourg, it just comes together. Um, I, I wanted to start today, my talk today is on Jewish exceptionalism. Um, and we'll, I want to talk in a minute what I mean by Jewish exceptionalism. But we're going to start, I'll start with the Old Testament, then some 17th century readings of the Old Testament. You can tell I'm a literature theology person. And then moving on to the 20th century with political anti-Semitism, obviously Nazi Germany, and then to talk a little bit about anti-Semitism today, especially on the progressive left. Um, it seems like a tall order, but I think we can do it. Anyway, so here is, in, on, in this image is from the cathedral. It's now in a museum across the street. It's called, I think in French, Église et Synagogue, Church and Synagogue. So these were on different portals of the entrance to the church. And in these two, in these two images are represented Christianity and Judaism. As two sisters, it looks like, right? Can you see the image? It's a, it, I mean, there's a, dark, there's a dark picture. You just saw it. Oh, so you're bored of this already. You saw it, you saw it in what context? Oh, I sh I sh I sh should he come back maybe? I don't know. Anyway, so, can, so, so since you're all experts now, I can rely upon you. Um, so how do you read this image? How do you read this, uh, this image? Triumph of the church. Uh, oh, that's, that's a simple, simple sure. Sure. The devil devil the triumph of the church. church. What about some of, I mean, uh, well, synagogue, synagogue is, of course, blind. blind. What, what else, else, what else did we just notice about, about the, 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 the iconography? iconography. Symbols. What, 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 what is, is, what is, is the, what, what is she holding? holding? The broken cane. cane. What, well, first, first of all, the, 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 the church is holding a crucifix and the chalice, which probably I think represents the Eucharist. And the, the, and the woman, she's looking downcast and she's blindfolded and she's holding the book of the law in her hand, which it seems like she's about to drop. Um, anything else notable about this? What, who's rectitude? Uh, Here's a nice image of the synagogue. Pardon? Pardon? Uh, the, 
the, the Christian as a image of the yeah. woman is very right. She's erect, she's clear, she right. is um, clearly on the right hand. Right. Would, would, would you, you say, say, especially after your previous lecture, it, I mean, first of all, anti Semitism, as we know, is a 19th century political phenomenon. But let's use it as a metaphor here. How, how anti Semitic is this? Or maybe a better way of putting it, is there something about the representation which makes it more complicated? I see some more pictures here. Yeah. Somebody had an idea? Yeah. Well, the female Jewish woman is more Right. I mean, that is, that is interesting. I mean, Jewess or the Jew? The Jew, the Jew, yeah. Um, you think she's more eroticized, but she looks more she looks more human, that's for sure. Right? I mean, the fact that you said that the church stands upright makes synagogues, synagogues not standing upright all the more prominent. Yeah. Arrows, but I see it as vulnerable. Sure, sure. Um, and and defeat, there's, there's obviously the defeat there as well. Eyesight. Right. But also, the, the image of the dejected son of God mm. really borrows from the figures of mm. the daughter of Zion mm. in Lamentations, um, this idea of uh -huh. destroyed, downtrodden uh -huh. Jewish people represented as right. a Jewish people. Right, and the appropriation here of that Old Testament image for this particular representation. They are sisters. Which is interesting, right? Um, it could be more negatively represented. You've pointed out these things about her. I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's eroticism, but certainly about her humanity. I think the image in the museum uh, across the street from the church had the caption that she's awaiting future redemption, which is, of course, a very Chris, I mean, obviously a very Christian reading, right? Um, but I think, I think in this image, there is a slight bit of ambivalence. There is, and, and I think that the Christian relationship to the Jews over the ages, generalization alert, is characterized by both anxiety and ambivalence, or maybe by ambivalence and anxiety. I think we see this kind of emphasis here. They're, they're two sisters, they both have the same father, right? And the same mother, presumably. So they're, they're allied, but obviously different. And the New Testament figure, she gains her rectitude. She becomes upright because of her reliance, in some sense, on her Jewish sister. I mean, that's not me reading the image necessarily, but it's certainly the history of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Which kind of gets me to my next question to talk about the title of my talk. Um, exceptionalism. How would, how, would somebody help me define that? What does it mean to be exceptional? I mean, we all know what it means, you know, Google definition-wise. Yeah? Sociologically outside the norm, uh -huh. different from... Right. right. I mean, I mean exceptional, exceptional can have... have I guess that's interesting. I was thinking of the more positive con connotations, but it also can have those negative connotations as well. Uniqueness? Uniqueness, right. Well, uniqueness, I think, is really important. Um, Pardon? Um, so the question really is, go back to this image. If the church is dependent on some level to synagogue, like how do we understand that relationship? Are there any like New Testament scholars here? No? So that's both good that nobody's going to find out my silly. Are you a New Testament scholar? No. Early church, well, that counts, right? Um, um, okay, so if I make any mistakes, you'll correct me. Um, is the Old Testament for Christians a problematic text? No, a resounding no. Hmm. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if you were setting up Christianity let's say, um, and you had these new Gospels, what would you do with the old stuff? You know, the rabbis next door are busy canonizing these texts, right? You, you want to keep it. 
Anybody, and if, if we had a conference on this, you know, would we keep it or jettison it? Yeah. yeah I'm 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 boy, you're talking faster than I. Sorry. The concept of supersessionism, where right. you're keeping it, but you're keeping it with uh, the concept of understanding. Supersession meaning that the Christians are superseding right. the Jews. Right. The Jews are the uh, Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Right. God, and right. The Right, and that's in that image. This is a supersessionist image, really, right? Yeah. But you definitely have to keep the old text bearing in mind that the majority of the New Testament did not exist in the time of the early church, okay. meaning that the vast majority of the Old Testament I see. From the old okay. Testament. That, 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 I, I don't know the history of the Old Testament, though. Um, is there anybody who would be against it? Yes. Okay, Barbara, yes. You only want to keep the portion of the prior text. It's like the Mueller report, you erase some of it? Yes. <laughs> you, you eliminate anything that doesn't validate or prove your perspective. Uh, so, so Barbara's the raising the point that the Old Testament, yeah, she's raising the point that, there, that, that the Old Testament, as an independent text, may have some connotations which would be problematic for Christians. It's good and foundational, and it, it legitimizes you, but you only keep the stuff that validates yeah. the present existence. So uh -huh. References to the future Christ, future prophet, you keep that from the Old Text. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, text, you, keep, you keep uh -huh. everything and the Old Testament will demonstrate the fact that Jesus was the Christ. Oh, okay. You keep everything, uh -huh. so, like, so plus your, you added your, all the books that are not in the, in, 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 in the version of Judaism, yeah. like the Maccabea. Okay. Of I mean, you're, even you're, more complete well, wait, wait, the okay. wait, 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 just a second. You're already adding an interpretive level, right? And, oh, and that's true. So we, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, um, I, I just want to get back to the question, as, as our New Testament scholar, or sorry, our early church scholar will tell you, that it wasn't so simple to early Christians that they were going to include the Old Testament. That Augustine was up against um, a group called, a sect called the Manichaeans, right? The Manichaeans believe in a binary universe. There's, it's kind of like the Star Wars universe. There's a force of good and a force of evil. They, and obviously Augustine opposed them on that as well. Um, and a lot of Augustine's writing are, are, is reflecting his dialogue with the Manichaeans. The Manichaeans said, let's get rid of this text. It was Augustine, I'm sure it's a more complicated story than I'm representing it, it was Augustine who made sure that the Old Testament became the Old Testament. Meaning before that it was the Jewish scriptures, right? When Augustine and the early church now canonizes the Bible, right, as New Testament and Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, right? We don't, I don't go to shul every Saturday morning and take a Old Testament off the shelf, right? Right? Take something, I take the, the, the five books of Moses, right? Um, so Augustine felt that the Old Testament should be included. The Manichaeans, however, opposed it. You know? Did you have a comment? I, yeah. I was just going to add because I wanted to know the last bit talk. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the Manichaean thing is really important. I think also we have to think about when they were trying, I was thinking like fourth century, if you're trying to, a little bit earlier, if you're trying to convert people mm -hmm. and you have certain things, for example, which would be in the Old Testament that wouldn't work with them, such as um, prescriptions about clothing or food, that you wouldn't want to appreciate that. Right, right. Oh, and circumcision. Also, we have this view from modern times of like the Bible as one book, but that's not how it worked. They would pick Old Testament books that would further their mission, and that's what they would use. Not, not even just looking at England, the monasteries didn't even have all the Old Testament books. They might, they would have all the Gospels, but they would pick and choose certain Old Testament books. So, so if you, you want, think of it as one unified. If you want the more complicated story, I'll talk to her at lunch. Right, yeah. Pardon? If I may add something, the Manichaeans, they were not Christian. You speak about the Marcionite. Okay. It was a Marcionite to reject any origin of the Jewish people. The Manichaeans, actually, St. Augustine was a Manichaean. Okay. But they were from Persia. They had okay. nothing to do with all the Holy Scripture. Nothing okay. to do. They were not Christian. Uh, I, I'm, they were the Marcionites. What, what, what I want to just be sensitive to is the way in which what we call the Old Testament might be problematic for Christians. And it becomes problematic, yeah, in the back, yeah? I'm just, uh, when you say the way we call the Old Testament, you don't have to read here. Oh, sorry. So I'm, 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 using, I'm doing the normative scholarly way. I even do this in, I do this in a classroom in Israel. I'm just used to the, the yeah. Torah and the Gospels, because Old and New and Okay, 
your guys are tough audience, all right? I'm just doing my best. I'm doing my best here, okay? All right, right. I mean, obviously, there's going to be subtlety and nuance to what I'm... I had a professor in university who used to speak, to speak about what he called bumpkin histories. A bumpkin history is a kind of simplistic, broad-stroke history. So why do you tell it? Because it can be useful, right? And then over lunch, you talk to all the really smart people, right? And you fill in the gaps, right? The story I'm telling is necessarily simplistic, but it can be, it, it, I think it's a useful one to have, a useful frame. Yes? Yeah, um, just a small point. In yeah. The, in the time of the yeah. Uh, what was kept in the Old Testament was not the Hebrew Bible. Okay. You have Jerome translating it into a Latin Bible, which supersedes the Hebrew Bible. Okay. So, right, so there are all sorts of things having to do with the history of translation, which would also be significant. Do you have a handout that I handed out? Yeah. yeah. Can I have one of them? Uh -huh. <laughs> Right, I mean, I would <laughs> what's a problematic text in, in the Old Testament? Um, in, in Galatians, Paul writes, to Abraham were the promise made and to his seed. His seed being Zerah Yaakov, Zerah Yitzchak, right? The seed of Yitzchak, the seed of Yaakov. He saith not, and to his seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Jesus Christ, this is what whoever was sitting there before was commenting upon, is one way of dealing with the text that's problematic is through interpretation. But why is this particular text problematic? I mean, what, what, is this, in, in, what is the simple meaning of the, of the text in the Old Testament when it refers to the seed of Abraham? Make believe, let's be biblical scholars. What's, what's the simple meaning? The Israel, uh, the people of Israel, right? And, and that's a problem for Christians. Meaning if I'm going to retain all of the stories in Genesis, then I have to deal with the apparent claim again and again and again of Jewish exceptionalism. And I think that that fact of Jewish exceptionalism back to the Old Testament is always a source of a kind of Christian anxiety. Looking back at our picture, I would see both anxiety and ambivalence. Now, anxiety can express itself in many ways, right? Anxiety, as we'll see with Martin Luther, can express itself in, in, a, in a kind of violence or call for violence. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Here, what was, what was Paul's original name? Saul. Saul of Tarsus, Shaul, Shaul HaTarsi. So when he had his revelation on the way to Damascus. Paul is, I think, what, what um, the literary critic Harold Bloom, do you know his name? Right, Harold Bloom is a famous critic of Shakespeare, Milton. Um, he wrote a, a famous book called The Anxiety of Influence. Instead of seeing the relationship of text as traditional, he sees later authors not coming and representing the tradition of earlier authors, but really great authors, what they do is they kill off their predecessor. So Milton, when writing Paradise Lost, kills off, who would you have to kill off? Homer and Virgil. I Meaning you look back to the past and you see these really great texts, and in some sense they make you, why would they make you anxious? They already did everything. Who can write after Homer? Who can write after Virgil? Milton says, I can, but in order to do that, he has to kind of push them aside. When Milton himself became a poet as well, he looked, it was only, not only Milton, it was not only um, Homer and Virgil, it was also, of course, Shakespeare, right? How can, you, how can you write after Shakespeare? How can you do anything after Shakespeare? So Bloom refers to people like Milton as a strong reader. And I think the strongest reader in the entire Western tradition is Paul, because he takes the Old Testament and he reads it strongly is he appropriates it entirely for Christianity. Meaning, I mean, in some sense, it's Paul really who's creating Christianity. <laughs> through, through, yeah. I just need to check. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Paul himself was Jewish. There was no such thing as Christianity as we would understand it back then. Mm -hmm. He was a Jewish thing. He simply gave an innocent interpretation of Judaism. Pardon? Paul is simply given an innocent interpretation of Judaism. Okay, well, okay. 
It's a very strong reading of Judaism. I mean, you could say the same thing about the rabbis of the Talmud. They're giving an interpretation yes. of Judaism. Okay, fine. Yeah, fine. Good. Okay. Um, um. So, so Paul here is rereading the Old Testament text. It really doesn't refer to Israel. Rather, it refers to um, what's what are they and to thy seed, who is the seed of Christ. Everybody, right? So we take a particularist text, a text which, which emphasizes the exception, and we turn it into something universal. Um, Luther, another of the great strong readers, right? Here's from his book, The Jews and Their Lies. Has this come up at all during this past week? Have you, have you ever read any of this? Luther, Luther is quite a master of, of, of um, polemic. This, oh, do, can you guys all have it, or should I put it up on the screen? Everybody has. This I want, everybody does not have it. Okay. Okay. This I wanted to say for strengthening of our faith. Oopsie. Jews will not give up their pride in boasting about their no nobility and lineage. What do Jews boast about? Nobility and lineage. The source of their nobility is their lineage. As was said above, their hearts are hardened. Our people, however, must be on their guard against them, lest they be misled by this impenitent, accursed people who give, who give God the lie and haughtily despise all the world. Not too much ambivalence here, right? For the Jews would like to entice us Christians to their faith, and they do this wherever they can. If God is to become gracious also to them, the Jews, they must first of all banish such blasphemous prayers and songs that boast so arrogantly about their lineage from their synagogues, from their hearts, and from their lips. For such prayers ever increase and sharpen God's wrath towards them. However, they will not do this, nor will they humble themselves abjectly, except for a few individuals whom God draws unto himself particularly and delivers them from terrible ruin. Why is Luther so concerned with this lineage business? It's, 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 it's the, the same, same anxiety, anxiety that Paul has, right? right? I mean, Luther's expressing it much more aggressively. That Jews are claiming to be a special people. And, what is, and how do they claim to be a special people? On the basis of their particularity. On the basis of their being an exception. And, th and throughout church history, there is this anxiety about Jewish exceptionalism. Luther continues, Does, um, Dear Moses, what do you mean? Luther starts out by quoting something from Deuteronomy in which Moses tells the people of Israel that they should circumcise their hearts. So Luther says, well, what does that mean? Meaning, if you're circumcising your heart, then you don't have to circumcise your flesh. Does it not, does it not suffice that they are circumcised physically? They are set apart from all other nations by this holy circumcision and made a holy people of God. And you rebuke them for stubbornness against God? You belittle their holy circumcision? You revile the holy circumcised people of God? Very strong reading here. You should venture to talk like that today in their synagogues. If there were not stones conveniently near, they would resort to mud and dirt to drive you from their mist, even if you were worth ten Moses is. What, what is Luther saying? What, why is Luther, why is Moses an, a good guy according to Luther? Because Moses understood in rebuking the Jewish people to circumcise their heart that that was what was most important. And Moses here is represented as having a kind of knowledge that the Jews themselves did. By virtue of such futile, arrogant circumcision in the flesh, they presume to be God's only people until the foreskin of their heart has become thicker than an iron mountain. That's a lot of metaphors there, right? And they can no longer hear, see, or feel their own clear scripture, which they read daily with blind eyes, overgrown with a pelt thicker than the bark of an oak tree. I didn't know Luther was such a poetic uh, figure. Um, but again, we see this sense of anxiety in relationship to Jewish particularism. 
I think Luther calls in the Jews in their lives for the burning down of church, for the burning down of synagogues. Meaning for Luther, the very presence of the Jew is problematic. Is, are there any historians, what, what, Luther, what Luther says here about Jews converting Christians, how common was that? I, 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 I can't imagine very common, right? So you see that kind of anxiety and this creating of a threat that doesn't even really exist. Um, okay, can, we, can I just take a 30 second break? I do this in my classes all the time. Yeah, it's okay, we can do that, you can stretch also. I make a distinction between stretching breaks, bathroom breaks, and coffee breaks. This is a stretching break. Okay. Okay. Who here has read Paradise Lost? Oh, so it's such an educated group of people. Nobody ever raises their hand when I say this. Not even my students, <laughs> unfortunately, when we're reading it. Um, um, see this, I, I can tell when I put up the poetry on the board, people are getting like yawning and feeling bored, but this is for me the exciting part, right? So we'll read a little poetry and then we'll come back to, we'll come back to, we'll come to 20th century anti-Semitism, stuff that's much more um, directly in our purview. So this is Milton's famous invocation to Paradise Lost. In writing Paradise Lost, Milton is claiming a kind of holy inspiration, which of course is an enormous amount of chutzpah, right? And while Homer in his epics calls out to the nine muses, Milton on several occasions will call out to his muse, but his muse is a little bit different than the muse of the Homeric works. So 26 lines, we'll read them a, a bit at a time. Of man's first disobedience in the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world, and all our woe with loss of Eden. What, what, are, what's, what are the first four lines characterized by? First four and a half lines? Oh, it's, it, well, it's, ac it's actually after Genesis. I mean, it's the text Genesis, right? Um, it's Adam and Eve having fall. It, it's, it's, it's a bummer here, right? Disobedience, mortality, death, woe, loss. Now the Christian kicker, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Who's the one greater man? Right? Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or Sinai. What's Oreb? It's, Oreb is the mountain in, in Israel, Horeb. Um, or, or Oreb, or of Sinai, Milton's favorite word is or, didst inspire that shepherd. Who's that shepherd? Yeah? Okay, Moses, yeah, I mean, that's what it's going to be. That shepherd who first taught the chosen seed. Different muse here, right? You see that Milton is obviously saying to Virgil and Homer, you did that already, but what I'm going to do is much better. That shepherd who first taught the chosen seed. Who's that? Jews, right? And, and here is, talk about chutzpah, this is the most chutzpah dick line in all of English poetry. That shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Milton is incorporating the Bible into his text. Or, if Sion Hill delight thee more, what's Sion Hill? Hartzion, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Or Siloah's brook, Shiloh, that flowed fast by the oracle of God. Where do you usually find oracles? Right, right. it's, it's here, here Milton. Milton. I'm just Milton 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 a ton of different things, things here. here. One of the things he's doing is taking an earlier classical tradition and incorporating it into his poem. So Milton's Paradise Lost, somebody used the term before, is a supersessionist poem, right? It's superseding not only, as we'll see, the Jews, but it's also superseding Virgil and Homer. English culture is the best ever and my poem is the best ever. Um, and he really thinks of this, he really thinks of this. Fast, and, and, and he's almost right. Fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian Mount. The Aeonian Mount, of course, is in Greece, and his poem is gonna soar over it, while it pursues things unattempted, yet in prose or rhyme. I'm gonna write something that nobody else has ever written before. Before all temples, 
And chiefly thou, O Spirit, here we're getting back to the Christian stuff, chiefly thou, O Spirit, before we said in Homer and Virgil there were nine classical muses, goddesses. Who's Milton's muse? And chiefly thou, O Spirit, he's a Christian, remember? It's the Holy Spirit. And chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. What's Milton doing here with these lines? Does prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. What's better, the particular building that was built in Jerusalem, made of rocks and stones and marble? What's better than that? The, the in, the, well, and what's happening really with Luther and Milton and Dunn and Shakespeare, of course, is kind of the invention of subjectivity. I mean, obviously it's Christian, but there's a real emphasis on interiority here, right? What's more important is not the external world, what's more important is the internal world. Was present and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sat brood brooding on the vast abyss and made it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine what is low, raise and support that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence. I want to just focus on these lines. Thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings up outspread, dove-like sets brooding on the vast abyss. Who is he calling out to here? I mean, this, this is, is a continuation, continuation of, and chiefly thou, thou spirit. spirit. And, and that, that spirit, says Milton, thou, you, from the first was present at the very beginning, at the beginning of Genesis, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like set brooding on the vast abyss, and made it pregnant. What's, what, what is Milton referring to in Genesis? Uh, I think I, I have it. it. Is, is there, there something, something like, like that, that in Genesis? Genesis? Right? right. Here's Here's Hebrew. Hebrew. Okay. okay. It, it says, says oh, sorry. sorry. So the Hebrew, And who, does anybody know Hebrew here? Some people, yeah? How would you translate that? Ruach Elohim, Yeah? The sun is floating uh, over the face of the water. Right. So Ruach is the key term here, right? And Ruach can mean wind. I've seen it translated as wind. Now, now uh, yeah. Yeah, well, sure. I mean, Milton is obviously going with that, right? But I see that maybe some of your responses, maybe some of you had Christian educations, are spirit, right? My, my students' response is, what? Because they are familiar with the text and their understanding of the text from their tradition. But what Milton is doing here is the same thing that we saw Paul doing, that is taking the Christian text, and, take, I'm sorry, taking the Jewish text and rendering it Christian. So much so that when you go back and read the earlier line about that shepherd, who is that shepherd now after we've read this 20, uh, the 27 lines? Jesus. Jesus, right? Which really transforms the whole idea of chosen seed. It's almost like Luther is hiding there, or Paul is hiding there inside of Milton's story. The thing that's really incredible about uh, Paradise Lost, and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it, is that if interpretive work needed to be done on the Old Testament, as we were suggesting earlier, Augustine and Paul do that as interpretation, meaning they interpret the text. Milton rewrites the text, incorporating all of that Protestant interpretation. It's almost like, if this is resonant for you, a kind of Christian midrash. A midrash is a rabbinic um, tale, a rabbinic interpretive story. And it's almost like Milton is taking the Old Testament and then rewriting it, doing exactly what you guys automatically said in relationship to what I was, when I referred to the chosen seed, you already had those interpretations in place. So Milton has them in place, and he tells the story over. Uh, well, so for sure. 
Oh, it's, 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 it's definitely, I mean, it's, it's, I would have thought it's, first of all, it's a pastoral shepherd, somebody who would go out to one of the gardens with, here with sheep. Then it's Moses, but ultimately it's Christ. Oh, right, okay, no, I, I, would not argue, I would not argue with you that, the, I would not argue with you that the simple meaning is Moses. Of course it's Moses, right? Of course it's Moses. But when I go, after I read 26 lines, I think I see more than I thought I saw at the beginning. Okay, um, let's see. I mean, so all of these texts really, starting with our, our image of, of church and synagogue, express some kind of relationship between the church and the Jews. I, I, I live in Israel now, and years ago I went to Berlin. And I had to decide, like, am I going to do the Jewish concentration camp tour, or am I going to hear symphonies, right? I decided to hear symphonies in the end, right? And I, I thought of those two things as being really separate. But really, the history of Europe is inseparable, inseparable from anti-Semitism. It bases itself on it in some sense. Because as we're seeing here, all of Christian later Christian representations of Christianity have to come to terms with the Old Testament. It's always there. And the Jew is a reminder. Luther found this reminder so, so problematic that he wanted to burn their, their shuls, to burn their synagogues. Because the Jews are a persistent reminder of another perspective, of another way. So I think at the heart of Christianity is this in tremendous anxiety in relationship to, to relationship to Judaism. And anxiety can manifest itself in various forms. And it can, it can manifest itself for example, in the, in the anger and violence of Luther, I mean, or, which is in contrast to what we saw in that, in that image from the Stras Strasbourg Cathedral, and that same kind of violence that's present in Luther obviously gets expressed in the 20th century as well. I think on Wikipedia it says the Jews and their lies is, did not lead up to the Nazis, but was just a part of the traditions of medieval anti-Semitism. I don't know what, the, some historian will probably have to say, what, what, are the, how, what are the continuities between those things, between medieval anti-Semitism and the anti-Semitism of the Nazis. Um, just changing gears now to 20th century anti-Semitism and 21st century anti-Semitism, but still focusing on exceptionalism and the problem of Jewish exceptionalism. So there's a literary critic named George Steiner, absolutely brilliant guy, um, who wrote, who gave some lectures at Yale in 1970. He was responding to um, lectures that T.S. Eliot had given earlier called Notes Towards the Definition of Culture. And in 1970, Steiner gives lectures at Yale called Notes Towards, uh, subtitled, Notes Towards the Definition of Culture. It's called In Bluebeard's Castle. Um, Steiner, I think, was compelled to do it again because Eliot is writing notes towards the definition of culture in the 40s and makes no mention of the Jews and no mention of the Holocaust. And Steiner says, we have to go back to that. And he, comes, he goes back to this and provides a reading of, of, of anti-Semitism as, again, a protest against exceptionalism. Did you have an, a comment you wanted to make? Go Hello? Hold. Okay. okay. Um, Let's go, back, let's go to our sheets. We're skipping Spinoza. Read that in your spare time. Mm. Right. Okay. That intent takes us to the heart of certain instabilities in the fabric of Jewish culture, of Western culture, in the relations between instinctual and religious life. You see what he's doing is inflected by Freud, obviously. Hitler's jibe 
that consci- Jew- sorry, Hitler's jibe that conscience is a Jewish invention provides a clue. He goes on, and we'll keep that, that distinction between instinctual and religious life. So it's a terrifying article that he writes, a book. The Holocaust is a reflex, the more complete for being long inhibited of natural sensory consciousness, of instinctual, polytheistic, and animistic needs. Europe has been repressed for hundreds of years, and it really wants to express its animal, animist and polytheistic desires. In the Holocaust, there was both a lunatic retribution, a lashing out against intolerable pressures of vision, and a large measure of self-mutilation. For Steiner, the Holocaust represents Europe killing itself. By killing the Jews, by killing their conscience, they were killing, destroying itself. The secular, materialist, warlike community of modern Europe sought to extirpate from itself, from its own inheritance, archaic, now ridiculously obsolete, but somehow inextinguishable carriers of the ideal. The carriers of the ideal being, being the Jews. Again, the, the, references, the reference points here are not so much theological. Europe is described as secular, warlike, and materialist. And yet, there's still that unignorable presence of the Jews. They are the carriers of the ideal. In the Nazi idiom of vermin and sanitation, there is a brusque insight into the infectious nature of morality. You see, he's a great writer, right? A brusque, a, a, a brusque insight into the infectious nature of morality. And according to Steiner, Europe wants to inoculate itself from morality. What's wrong with morality? Well, in, for, in Steiner's register, we'll talk about 21st century register in a bit. In Steiner's register, morality is the thing that doesn't allow one's animist and polytheistic and irrational instincts to express themselves. Monotheism at Sinai, primitive Christianity, messianic socialism, these are the super, three supreme moments in which Western culture is presented with what Ibsen termed the claims of the ideal. These are the three stages profoundly interrelated through which Western consciousness is forced to experience the blackmail of transcendence. Unceasingly, the blackmail of perfection has hammered at the confused, mundane, egotistical frame of common instinctual behavior like a shrilling note in the inner ear. Men are neither saints nor ascetics. Their imaginings are gross. Ordinarily, their sense of the future is, is the next milestone. But the insistence of the ideal continued with a terrible, tactless force. I find this particularly haunting, given what's happening in Europe today, meaning a lot of what we've taken for granted for decades in a few generations, I'm speaking really as an American now, the existence of democracy really seems to be challenged by what's happening all over the world, Eastern Europe, with the, the, with, with the kind of return of demagoguery. And of course, when demagogues return, they, they allow for the expression of this, these irrational forces. A friend of mine said that my, our grandparents would never have taken anything for granted in America, and they never did because for them, all they knew was a, a history of violence against them. It's only contemporary Americans, American Jews, who are like, what? You know, everything's great. And everything has been great. But, you can, but here, Steiner is bringing out this sense of there are these irrational forces, and democracy is a very delicate experiment. That's my commentary. Um, the mechanism is simple, but primordial. We hate most, we hate most those who hold out to us a goal, an ideal, a visionary promise, which even though we have stretched our muscles to the utmost, we cannot reach, which slips again and again, just out of range of our racked fingers, 
yet, and this is crucial, crucial, which remains profoundly desirable, which we cannot reject because we fully acknowledge its supreme value. In his exasperating strangeness, his exceptionalism, in his acceptance of suffering as a part of a covenant with the absolute, the Jew became, as it were, the bad conscience of Western history. As Hamlet says, conscience does make cowards of us all. And in a sense, that's what Steiner is saying in relationship to Europe. It made them cowards in regard to expressing their deepest desires and irrational um, lusts. In him, the abandonment of spiritual and moral perfection, the abandonments of spiritual and moral perfection, the hypocrisies of an established mundane religiosity, the absence of a disappointed, potentially vengeful God were kept alive and visible. So the Jews are the carriers of the ideal. It's interesting that for Steiner, it's not only Moses, also Jesus, also Marx, and to some extent, I think also Freud, that they are the carriers of the ideal. Yeah. Whoopsie. The genocide was no mere secular socioeconomic phenomenon. It enacted a suicidal impulse in Western civilization. We have this old expression, Western culture is dead. Can you still see that? You, know, you, see, you see a tweet online and you think, oh, now Western culture is dead, right? It's rock bottom now. And the next day you see something else. Well, Steiner was saying it in the 70s, right? Um, it enacted a suicidal impulse in Western civilization. It was an attempt to level the future, or more, more precisely, to make history commensurate with its natural savageries intellectual torpor. You'd think he's a little bit of elit elitist Steiner and material instincts of unex unextended man. What he means really is uneducated man, right? Using theological metaphors, and there is no need to apologize for them in an essay on culture, the Holocaust may be said to mark a second fall. We can interpret it as a voluntary exit from the garden and a pragmatic, programmatic attempt to burn the garden behind us. It's not only that we're leaving paradise. We're destroying it on the way out. Less, you see, I mean, Steiner is this lonely figure, right? He's this figure of enormous learning, living in what he considers to just be a culture of complete, not, not only immorality, but lack of any education or culture. Lest its remembrance continue to infect the health of barbarism. Is barbarism healthy in the world today? With debilitating dreams or with remorse. Don't make, barbar, barbar, don't make barbarians self-conscious. And the people who are best at making barbarians self-conscious over the years, over the generations, over the centuries, over the millennia, have been the Jews. And for Steiner, Hitler's final solution is the destruction of the Jews. Turn Judaism into a museum. Hitler said to, the, to um, the community in Prague um, that he wanted to turn Judaism into a museum, or he said that in general. Now, if you go to Prague, I got a ticket for the Jewish Museum. The Jewish Museum is the city, right? It allows you to go into all these different synagogues, cemeteries. There's one synagogue which has the names of all of the people, 70,000, who were killed during the Holocaust. And I, the brochure where I read about Hitler's plan was from this synagogue, and the synagogue considered itself to be a protest. Look, we did this, we made this. But in a sense, I thought to myself, they fulfilled what Hitler wanted, right? Because in, 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 in Prague, there, there are Jews who live in Prague still, but a, in terms of a vibrant Jewish community, there's nothing there, nothing, right? Um, so Hitler, I mean, his idea was to turn all of Europe into a museum. We can look at the Jews in a museum. We don't want them around us. They make us uncomfortable. Now, can I walk with this? Yeah? Yeah? So, so what's, 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 what's the, the relationship, relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? I ask you because you've been thinking about it for a week, and I just came from a conference on John Milton. So give me something to work with. 
I mean, is there still a protest against Jewish exceptionalism? Pardon? Right. Right. Like relationship with like Western governments and everything bad that happens and right. like that's couched in right. Right. And so, so a lot, a lot of the same kind of tropes that are used by anti-Semites are also used by anti-Zionists. What was the first thing you said? Uh, the ah, right. Right. I mean, also this idea that there's a jerk, that there's some kind of Jewish conspiracy behind all of, all of history. history. And, and, and anything, anything else, else about anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? There's also, sorry, certain specific things about killing Palestinian babies, mm. things that recall the uh, blood 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 right, right. To get a little more insight into that, I really want to get to talk about progressive anti-Semitism. For me, I had this like revelation of understanding the problematic nature of left anti-Semitism because by nature I'm a liberal. And I find myself in many cases agreeing with a left-wing agenda. So it made it much harder for me to see the anti-Semitism on the left. The anti-Semitism on the right I have no problem seeing in Trump's America, right? But there is there is an equal problem with left-wing anti-Semitism, and in many ways it's much more sophisticated than right-wing anti-Semitism. Steiner writes, gives those lectures in 1970. In 1986, he writes not about the Jews, but about Israel. And through this piece, I'd like to start, after the, we look at this piece, I'd like to talk a little bit more about progressives. Okay. At the same time, doubtless, the centrality of the book does coincide with and enact the condition of exile. There are radical senses in which even the Torah is a place of privileged banishment from the tautological immediacy of Adam's speech. He's having a good time here, right? Um, reading textual exegesis are an exile from action, from the existential innocence of praxis, even where the text is aiming at practical and political consequences. You might wish that he writes a little bit more simply here. What's he saying here? Reading and textual exegesis are an exile from action. I mean, we see the beginning of the framing of the Jew as in an ideal world of the text. The Jew is, real, is, is, is understood in relationship to the text. The textuality of the Jewish condition, from the destruction of the temple to the foundation of the modern state of Israel, can be seen, has been seen by Zionism as one of tragic impotence. The text was the instrument of, of exile, survival. That survival came within a breath of annihilation to endure it all the people out of the book had once, the people of the book had once again to be a nation. For Steiner, moving from that position of people of the book to a nation is a letdown. The Jews don't occupy the realm of action or praxis. They occupy the realm of the text. It's an interesting representation of the Jews, right? A true thinker, I love this, a true thinker, a true thinker, just in case you don't get it, he's hitting you over the head, right? A true thinker, a true thinker, a scholar must know, this is Steiner's autobiography, right? That no nation, no body politic, no creed, no moral ideal and necessity, be it that of human survival, is worth of a falsehood, a willed self-deception, or the manipulation of a text. He can't possibly mean this, can he? He says it's, it's worse to, m to misinterpret a text, presumably intentionally, 
than the possibility of putting human survival at risk. A true scholar knows that the most important thing is getting the text right. I mean, he starts out the first paragraph saying, you know, we understand that Zion had to be founded. It was a tragic, oh, it, it, it was a necessity. But here he seems to be saying that all that matters is the text. The knowledge and observance are his homeland. It is the false reading that makes him homeless. The prophetic and the speculative addition to insight are the nationhood of Judaism. How is Steiner characterizing, characterizing the Jewish people here? It's like this ideal entity, right? This ideal entity in, in some kind of virtual study hall that extends over the generations and every possible place. How can a thinking man, I mean, basically, Steiner is saying there is an incommensurability between a Jew being human and interpreting texts and a Jew having a state. This is kind of a, almost a primer, as we'll see, for progressive anti-Semitism. When the Jew has a nation, he ceases to be a man. He becomes something else. We'll see, he, he speaks it out. How can a thinking man, a native of the world, be anything but the most wary and provisional of patriots? Real intellectuals, says Steiner, can't be patriots. The nation state is founded on the myths of inspiration and patriotism. It perpetuates itself by lies and half-truths, machine guns and submachine guns. That is the alternative to this idea of truth and truth thinking and reading the text properly are machine guns and submachine guns. You see, you can see it's getting to Israel soon, right? The sole citizenship of the cleric is that of a critical humanism. It's like, it's like, this is like Steiner's philosopher king, right? He knows not only that nationalism is a sort of madness, a virulent infection. I like the way infection returns to his work here. Starts out as being the infection of morality. Now it's the infection of nationalism, edging the species towards a mutual massacre. The man or woman at home in the text is by definition a conscientious objector to the vulgar mystique of the flag and the anthem. Steiner, by the way, lives in Switzerland. It's a kind of important fact, right? Here we go. Here now, now, Israel is a nation state to the utmost degree. So we start out with this whole discussion of the Jewish homeland as textual. Steiner goes on to talk about patriotism as a kind of vulgarity even an obscenity, and now we get to Israel. Israel is a nation state to the utmost degree, like no other. It lives armed to the teeth, 1986. It has been compelled to make other men homeless, servile, disinherited, in order to survive from day to day. As it was during two millennia, the dignity of the Jew that he was too weak to make any other being as unhoused, as wretched as himself. The propaganda of Israel, its rhetoric of self-deception, are as desperate as any contrived in the history of nationalism. It's interesting, the same person who was able to write with such eloquence about anti-Semitism, well, he's writing with equal eloquence about Israel, but his view of Israel is is, is, is um, pretty radically strong. I mean, what does it mean, Israel is a nation state to the utmost degree? What is he saying by that? I mean, the way I would look at it is that all nation states are built inevitably upon violence, power, and blood. In Aeschylus' trilogy, the Oresteia, some of you have read it, Athens is founded at the end, and the Furies, who all they demand through the three plays is blood, they're given blood-red robes, and they protect the city. And Aeschylus is acknowledging there that every city, is, it has to incorporate violence into it. And it seems to be that from Steiner's perspective, Israel is a, a nation state to the utmost degree, 
Only Israel gets blamed for protecting itself. Only Israel gets blamed. I don't even mean that. Only Israel gets blamed for the way, for the way in which a nation state must necessarily protect itself. For Steiner, when Israel becomes a nation, it lo- when it becomes a nation state, it loses its real identity. Hmm. Where, are my, where are my papers here? Okay. There is no, but then he, and then he makes the same concession, right? There is no singular vice in the practice of the state of Israel. These follow ineluctably on the simple institution of the modern nation state. Makes my point, right? On the political mil- military necessities by which it exists with and, with, with and against its nationalist competitors. It is by empirical need that a nation state uh, uh, sups on lies, where it has traded its homeland in the text for one of the Golan Heights or in Gaza. Eilis was the clair- clairvoyant epithet of that great Hebraist Milton. Judaism has become homeless to itself. Judaism, by gaining its home, has become a home. I mean, here he does make a concession to the needs of a state. But we'll see that he kind of rounds on that. The notion that the appalling road of Jewish life and the ever-renewed miracle of survival should have as their end, as their justification, the setting up of a small state in the Middle East, crushed by military burdens, petty and even corrupt in its politics, shrill in its patriotism, parochialism, is implausible. Steiner is saying here that it's not possible that 2,000 years of suffering should end with this. The betrayal of the text. So for Steiner, Jews have chosen particularity of nationhood and somehow betrayed their universalist agenda. Are there ways that we can see in which progressives borrow from this playbook? Progressives also have an antipathy to Jewish particularism. In the 20th century, when the great literary authors were writing narratives of return, the great literary modernists, Joyce writes Ulysses, The Return to Athens, right? T.S. Eliot writes The Wasteland, it's also a return narrative. Pound is also, Ezra Pound is also writing stories that go back to the ancient world. The Jews are the only people in history, or they're the, they're, sorry, the Jews in the 20th century actually live out the destiny of their literary text. Meaning for others, it's a fiction of return. The Jews return to their land. Joyce and Eliot are the great writers of literary modernism. This idea of high culture, of return, of cohesion, of the special nature of Greece. Where literary modernists will emphasize that special exclusion. Postmodernists, by contrast, are not, are not interested in any kinds of differences. So the Jew stands as having returned to Israel, and we're the one nation state that is still living out the modernist narrative in a postmodern world. The postmodern world says really nothing is privileged. Everything is the same. Nobody can make a, a, a a a privileged argument over another person. Is is there a better definition of postmodernism that I could be using here? Is there a better version of postmodernism that I could be using here? Right, everything is fluid. 
was the definition that you used? I'm sorry. I, 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 think, think, I think the definition I would suggest of postmodernism is this moral level. Living, living in a relative world. And living in a relative world, Jews are still making the same kinds of claims. Or Jews, we went back to Israel. We can, the, 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 myth, the myth that literary modernists could only write about was lived by Israelis, was lived by Jews. Again, so it's the modernist narrative triumphing, or, or the modernist narrative in a postmodern world. And the postmodern relationship to Jewish exceptionalism is you can't make such claims to exceptionality. Yeah, Sylvia. There's another dimension yeah. that you see in Steiner, which is mm. elevating the intellectual For sure. and um, delegitimating embodiedness. Right. Mm -hmm. And so right. he's making a demand right. of Jews right. that they right. do, they're, they're all mind and there's no physicality. When, 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 of course, the Jewish tradition is so much caught up with yeah. embodiment and yeah. action. And the idea of embodiment and action goes on to the state of Israel. Of course, it doesn't mean that the state of Israel is blameless. But for progressives looking at the state of Israel, it's all or nothing. Israel must be perfect or it should be nothing. With other nation states, we don't make the same kinds of claims. We don't, for example, I'm an American and an Israeli. In America, people could, nobody from in Israel comes up to me and says, so how do you feel about America now? Meaning they'll say, how do you feel about Trump? But people, people will come up to me and say, what do you think about Israel based upon Bibi? And, that, and, and, and suggest that somehow that the entire project is illegitimate. Nobody suggests the illegitimacy of the American project. Is the American project flawed? Yeah, yeah right? Um, but I'm going to go back into what we said earlier. It's flawed, but it's, it's, it's a good model, right? And the Israeli model is also a good model. And that's somehow what gets lost is that I, I, that progressives will look to Israel and say, if you can't meet up to the very highest standards, and this is Steiner, Steiner too, if you can't meet up to the very highest standards, erase yourselves. Your survival is not so important. Read the text properly. Go to yeshiva and learn properly, right? It's a, it's a crazy argument, and as you're all suggesting, it undermines the basic, one of the basic precepts of Judaism, which it is embodied. Is it embodied in an imperfect way in Israel? Absolutely. I mean, there are some you probably know in the religious world who also think in mystical terms, and they think that any attempt to, to have a state in Israel is contrary to God's will. You see these crazy people with the Iranian uh, pr uh, prime minister, Orthodox Jews, they're called the Turi Karta, right? They say also, there should be no Jewish state. We should eradicate the Jewish state. They have the same sensibility, though. All or nothing. If it's not perfect, delivered by God, the temple coming down magically, it's nothing. And that's the claim that progressives will continue to have against Israel. They were not perfect. Yeah. The imposition yeah. of progressivism <clears throat> has also become mm. an ideology mm. that when it articulates that Israel mm. utilizes all of mm. the historic <coughs> tropes, right. demonization, right. Right. Besides Jewish uh, right. and again, uh, the blood libel is throughout uh, their criticism. Uh, they still speak, uh, and there's no similar examination of the tunnels of the Palestinian community. Right, for sure, for sure, or, for sure. Or, or that right. the Palestinians <coughs> require what the Jews do not require. Right. Um, the, everybody knows this concept of intersectionality? Yes. Uh, are Jews part of that? What is that? Well, we have an answer in the back, which is this. <laughs> yeah. Of the intersectional question again? Yeah. Only if you're on the left. No. Oh, well, uh, I, uh, yeah, in the back, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily only if you're on the left. I think it's only if you're a stereotypical good Jew. But I also think that extends to other minority groups. Because uh, we don't well, that's people who are in power of the movement, so oftentimes are white people. Right. Um, if you don't fit into their idea of what a black person or a Jewish person should behave like, <coughs> then they are quick to criticize. Right. Well, well that, that's interesting. That happened with the, um, the, the 
uh, Chicago Dyke March, right, right, where Jewish women who were Zionists were excluded because somehow Zionism doesn't really fit into that intersectional <coughs> agenda. In some sense, progressives have taken up that Jewish mantle, though, the one that Steiner writes about, claiming that clarity of moral consciousness, which really has been so absent for decades, certainly on the left, that is, progressives are now occupying the space of the Jew, claiming the moral high ground, and demonizing the Jew as the evil other, the violent, I mean, really, the Jew as Israel. Yeah? Um, what I was saying, I think, um, that the thing about intersectionality, it's yeah. kind of like the women's march, and right. Right? Right. Um, where you know, they have no problem with Jewish women marching or right. women participating, but it was as soon as you put the Israel, you know, the right, right, right. 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 fight. Um, so I think it's not the demonization of Jews, more the demonization of Israel. Right, I think that's better said. What's, when you're talking about like good Jew, bad Jew type thing, um, like at school, uh, there's a big controversy about Israel, like some speaker, um, and there was a guy, a Jewish guy, um, who I used to be friends with, who basically used went, to be friends. Yeah, used to be friends. Okay. Was on a rant about Israel. He was like, well, as a Jew, like I don't understand how we can't hold ourselves to these standards. It's going to be perfect, you know, like all or nothing. You know, it has to be perfect. Because just went and listed a whole bunch of things. I was like, well, you know, I'm a good Jew because I understand that Israel, you right. know, is basically trash at the moment. It's virtue signal. Huh? Right. It's virtue signal. Yeah, exactly. It's complete virtue signal. Um, and instead of just accepting the fact that yeah, Israel's not perfect, and as a Jew, we should try to change it, mm -hmm. it's like a complete disavowalment of the concept, which is what progressive left, I think, is kind of right. I mean, it's, right. So, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I just had a question about yeah. what Steiner was saying. I, yeah. Um, I just want to make sure. So you're saying that he was saying that um, nationalism has corrupted Jewish people's place as a people of the world. Right. Because the place for the Jewish people is not to be, not to be a nation, or not to be a state, but to be a nation. You were saying that Steiner was saying that. Steiner was saying that. Right. Yeah. Right. Not to be a embodied state, but to be a nation of meaning in the broad sense. Yeah. Is it possible just to get, <coughs> sorry, uh, a definition for the pr progressive left? Uh, okay. Um, Did you have one? Yeah. No, oh, I, I, I just want to know what we're criticizing, and I just um, want to be more clear on. Well, I was I was starting to say that there's a tenor. You know what I would call it? I, I think the progressive left is, is if, if Trump has a, a populist base, which is not interested in democracy, I think there's, there's also a populist base on the left. Again, for me, it's harder to see because I identify with a lot of left politics. But there is a kind of embracing, not of democracy, but rather of belonging, that I need to belong to a certain group. And free speech, and listen, I'm not a right-wing free speech advocate. I'm a free speech advocate. I mean, and I also hate this idea that liberalism has now been associated with progressivism. I think to be a liberal is the ideal. And to fight against these, these narratives that progressives sometimes use, these demonizing narratives that somebody pointed out, in a way progressives are importing that same theological structure that has existed for centuries. And they are in the right. They, they are good. And who's evil? What's evil? Well, anything that's ra ra racist, sexist, et cetera. And I'm not advocating racism or sexism. But also, they're also, um, I think the anchor for progressivism, and I'm going to talk about this a little more tomorrow, is, is really their anti-Zionism. I think it starts there, that there is an, it, and this goes back to Steiner's argument, that the Jews represent a certain vision of civilization, a, a vision of hierarchy, of value, of morality, and progressive can't deal with that. So Jews are, Jews are, very, are not really part of Jewish, or Zionists, as you said, right? are not part of intersectionality. And I think you can make the argument, actually, that in intersectionality is built in a way to exclude the Jews, by definition. Yeah. Uh, so progressives, they abhor nationalism in general. Yeah. Uh, and maybe part of that because any, any nationalist claim is, is based on some sort of exceptionalism. Like 
by the American exceptionalism, which sure. they're very much against. Sure. Like every Fourth of July, American patriotic temple became controversial. Right. They just ripped down an American flag at a, um, one of these processing facilities in Texas and put up a Mexican flag. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, so that conservative is like going out of it, you know, apoplectic, right? Because he's creating that equivalent. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it, it makes sense that it will be so regardless of the up. All the anti science claims, yeah. the core and the bottom of it is the nationalism and, and it has to do with Jewish exceptionalism, right. which he, the postmodern absolutely abhor. But it doesn't still, for me at least, yeah. like I totally believe in, 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 in this model, uh, uh, conservative model, but it doesn't for, still explain why this obsession, like mm -hmm. the abhor all exceptionalism, mm -hmm. all nationalism, but there's still a specific kind of this obsession. Only about it. I, I, I think it's Steiner's argument. The first one is that the Jews have made a moral claim. We, you know, Jews, monotheists, Jews, and then Christians, Steiner acknowledges, invented monotheism, invented the ideal. And progressives are simultaneous, again, anxiety. The Jews represent, they are carriers of the ideal on the one hand. On the other hand, now, those who are screaming in the marketplace most about their ideals with the most convic conviction, I would almost say religious conviction, are progressives. Meaning, what, you, you can't have a, there are certain people you can't have a discussion with because their assumptions are such, they're in, it's like different theolo there are different theological models, different paradigms. And if you don't fit, I think you were saying this earlier, if you don't fit into that paradigm, and have certain beliefs and certain ideas, then you're not part of it. Again, I'm saying in the progressive world, just like on the, on the right with Trump's base, again in America, populism is taking over. It's, it's a sense of belonging and not democracy. It's almost, again, it's the Steiner's irrationalist urge for something that the rational doesn't supply. Yes? Uh, I yeah. really, <clears throat> I really want to encourage when you using the word uh, progressive, <coughs> that it is not limited to a set of sophisticated ideas that we can discuss or reject, but it is also including a set of behaviors. And why I say that is that I was able to get a hold of what is called uh, the playbook of, of BDS, mm -hmm. and they very carefully explain how you want to argue against Israel. And their first emphasis is on that when someone asks a sophisticated question, that is what you're doing with us, that you are to not answer them. That you are to physically move your body away. And when that doesn't work, it goes on to say that you can raise your voice in a certain way. So it is, again, a set of behaviors, strategies, mm -hmm. techniques, which accompany mm -hmm. the manifestations of what we're speaking about, okay. about the end of liberal democracy, both right. of it potentially. Uh, you brought up pedagogy, so let me just end with these comments, since there, I assume there are a lot of pedagogues here. Um, I, think, I think the idea in a classroom, when talking about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, is not to make a person a Zionist necessarily. The idea is not to accept the progressive binary, the all or nothing. The Harvard philosopher Hilary Putnam said, enough may not be everything, but enough is enough. And that really should allow for the possibility of an Israeli state that isn't perfect. But again, your role as educators is not to have people go to the Israel Day Parade, right? Your role of educators is to allow for conversation and discussion. And that means making students, I don't know if this is possible, who are maybe have a tendency towards BDS, to make them agnostics, to make them realize, and again, this is a version of Steiner's point, that their, mor that their moral certainty comes from, devolves, evolves from the same set of paradigms that they're attacking. So the idea would be to, I mean, the idea I think is to teach, I mean, obviously critical thinking. And I think, I think thinking about Israel-Palestine 
is a great way of developing critical thinking. If you don't, I mean, if you can avoid screaming in the classroom. Yes, one more question, then we'll end. Because yes, uh, Philip Chisa, not Thomas Central University, professor of education, talked about okay, because you're not in the uh, the, it, can you share, or anybody share, uh, strategies or pedagogical techniques which have worked in the past with the two uh, or groups or individuals who are fixed in a position and they are able to come together? So and, maybe then, and then the distinction yeah. of uh, nationalism and statehood. And then the intellectual imposition of a this is a more, the moral issue whereby you are, you are coming to replace me. Yeah. And the, the idea of how do we have a, a dialogue or discussion or whatever you call it? Because I, 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 I think we'll leave the, the language. The language is, uh, I see, it in which we so the rhetoric and all that. Okay. How can you, an example, just we can relate to, which you can, you can move from there, an example ever, ever, anybody who has ever. I, I think maybe we should save the pedagogical discussions for lunch because people are signaling me in the back and I'm happy to continue the conversation. But I think just a quick answer to your question is, again, not to aim for the extremes, to aim for the middle. When you have people dealing with different paradigms, it's very, you don't, those are the arguments, I in a way, you, do, you don't want to argue with the BDS guy in the room. Or if you are arguing with him or her, you're not, what your comments are not directed to him or her. They're directed towards the middle, towards people who are still open-minded. Thanks. <laughs>